Hello, my name is Richard Askham and welcome to another episode of Up Close and Personal, the FESPA podcast that's all about the world of personalization and everything really that, that comes to play with that world. Um, lots of things we're going to be talking about, lots of guests from all around the world over the next few weeks and months, all leading up to the new show that FESPA are producing in May 2023, the personalization experience. It will be in Munich at the end of May, co-located with their other events, and is the first time really in an opportunity for literally everybody to get involved in the conversation and the debate around personalization. One of the things that I'm trying to do is to invite lots of different and interesting guests with different and interesting perspectives on that. And my guest today is Mike Wistow from Ega Consulting. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Richard. How are you doing? I'm all right, actually. I'm not as cold as I as I have been. It seems to be. I, I don't know whether it's it, winter is you know uh, biting us as hard as it's possible to do at the moment in the UK. But it's it's uh, today. I've got the heating right in my office, so that's all good. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. I've got I've got the warm jumper today. So. You've got an interesting background there. What's what's going on behind you? Um, that's the Eiger on the River Trent, named after the the Viking god. And most people know about the uh, the tidal bore on the River Severn. Uh, this is the tidal bore on the River Trent, and I grew up um, not far from those two houses you can see in the top left-hand corner there, and okay. hence my, my my firm is called Ager Consulting because okay. it's, uh, it's it's hundred hundred yards from my house. Well, that's that's good to know. And for those uh, listening around the world, that you and I are both in a similar part of the world today. But for those listening around the world today, just just give an explanation of where in the UK the River Trent is. Uh, the River Trent, it, it, it's basically on the east. It's the, uh, predominantly the border between Lincolnshire and Nottinghamshire, which is the, the area that you and I know well. But it then continues across to the Midlands. So it's it's that kind of border east of the county, east of the country, sorry, and between the counties of Lincolnshire and Nottinghamshire. So if you're listening to this in America, it's, it's go from London, go north uh, for about two hours and you will end up in the Trent. Is that right? Basically, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, the former, really... former capital of the United Kingdom in something like nine forty seven um, uh, AD. So yes, I did not know that. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Swain, Swain, Swain. Yes, when the Vikings came up the river, they they made it their capital. Yeah. Well, I'm de- I'm actually technically descended from Vikings, Mike. So uh, my my surname Askham is a is a Danish Scandinavian uh, origin name. Um, and the east coast of the UK, of course, is where most of the Vikings landed. No surprise then that that's where I'm at descent yes. from, really. But, yes. uh, uh, but there we are. Anyway, I digress. Mike, it's lovely to see you, and thank you for joining me this morning on the podcast. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm interested in your views about personalization, but but from, from a, a different perspective, I've, I've had some guests on from the print industry, print manufacturers, print suppliers, but I, I wanted to get some sort of uh, impressions, really, from a broader world, but print users uh, as much as anything else and, and personalization uh, and how that sort of comes into your world. So if I start you off with my with my usual opening question of all of my guests, um, which is tell me what personalization means to you. Yeah, personalization. I, I like your expression about personalization being about starting conversations. And in general, I think it's about it's it's personalization for the person who's on the receiving end of whatever comes that we, we will see things differently depending on, on how we um, receive them. So if you and I have different backgrounds and the person does the same thing to us, we will receive them differently. I can I can expand on that if if, if you want me to, but it's Please. Like, so um, one one of the one of the examples I thought about in terms of describing this to people was 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 how do you do it? And I spent many years playing cricket. And um so one of the things for me is basically to say if I turn up and, and bowl a cricket ball and I bowl that cricket ball at somebody who's five foot tall or somebody who's six foot six, they will respond to it differently. One of them will be able to step backwards and smash it. Another will be able to step forwards and smash it. Some of them may actually get bowled, but they will receive it differently, although I'm doing it the same. If 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 I bowl that same ball again, then they will react differently to it. So there's something about personalization being how we receive something and the value of what we receive as it comes through to us. That's interesting. We've already instantly in the first two minutes lost our American audience who have no idea what cricket is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's the same. With, it's, the, it's the same with baseball, Richard. It's <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm kidding, but it's a really nice way of putting it, actually. And and I think sometimes this is where the debate around personalization has got a little bit stagnant, Mike. And, and one of the reasons for not only this show, um, the personalization experience, but also these podcasts, is is to try and reignite. Um, not not the debate, because I don't think it's a should you or shouldn't you. It's more a how should you or how shouldn't you. 
use personalization. In your experience in, in, in business, not only with you delivering your services, but also having services delivered to you, what, what are the times that you feel as though personalization has really hit the spot for you? Um, really hit the spot, that's an interesting one. Um, let's take let's take let's take a health service GPs. So um, the, the the first point of call in the health service in terms of the UK, um, there are times when you actually want someone to talk to you, to sit down with you because you're worried, you're frightened, you don't know what it is, and 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 so forth. Uh, there are also times when you're actually quite happy just to go along and say, "Give me a prescription," or you're quite happy to go along and say, "Take my blood," and, and all that kind of stuff. In the former case, it's really, really helpful if the person knows you, knows your history, and isn't looking just at the records and saying, tell me about it. In the latter case, you don't mind that kind of thing. Um, and so there is something there on the receiving end of that personalization that I think if the debate gets into something that says, where is it appropriate and where is it not appropriate, is is better than that kind of, it, it's all one thing or it's all another, I think. I've always taken the view, uh, Mike, that that the personalization in, in certainly in the world that I come from, from brand marketing and, and gifting, is a way of starting a conversation with a with a an individual within a larger group that you've that you've highlighted as somebody that you want to talk to directly. And and you've taken the trouble and the thought and the effort to do a, just a little bit of extra detail that, that allows that person to go, oh, that's that's nice. I I, I appreciate the fact that you've taken that thought. The value in that thought, of course, then transcends the value of the product to a certain extent, but it does create a keepsake and a memento. So what I'm driving at here is, and, and your point about the health service is a good one, what we want to do initially with the personalized approach is establish a relationship and from there choose how much or how little of that relationship we wish to remain as an individual and at what point are we happy to become part of the collective. Does that make sense? Makes the entire sense, yeah, yeah, and I th and I think that that whole bit about the relationship is then what will also take you into um, an individual conversation between human beings, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, you know one of the things that you've 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 said or written about is is that whole aspect of um, if if you personalise a gift, it's actually it's not the product that's important; it's the fact that you've thought about it. Correct, and you know. And, particularly because we're having this conversation, you know, sort of not too far away from Christmas. It's the, it's, it's the, have you thought about me enough that you want to do something? And is it, is it important to do that kind of thing? So, yeah. Yeah, no. And, and I think, you know, I can remember myself saying, I don't, I don't, I don't script these things. So I never remember what I've said. Unfortunately, this is quite a good way of listening back to, to, to my own yeah. thoughts to a certain extent, um, that it, it, it's a gift that happens to be made of a bottle of Coke. Uh, it's yeah. not a bottle of Coke as a gift. So the personalization, the, the detail, the thought, um, and the application of that and 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 really the consideration of that, because, you know, I'm also a firm believer on the other side of this argument, Mike, that, that just because you can doesn't mean you should. And, and sometimes I think businesses fall foul of wanting to appear as though they're putting thought in, but actually doing it in the least thoughtful way. For example, I don't believe that just having your name on a bar of chocolate makes it personal. Um, it's it's the memories that are attached to the reason that you're giving that bar of chocolate and the person you're giving it to that are the personal bit. Have you have you seen any examples uh, as a as a receiver of gifts from your family and from your friends where you've thought, oh, I wouldn't have done it that way? No, is the short <laughs> answer. Um, <laughs> you've got a good was, You're through to the next round. <laughs> I was I was thinking actually. I, I I thought you were taking that question in the opposite direction actually. And, and I was thinking, you know, when you know when somebody you know, plays something back to you that you, you you forget that you've done. So I I did a piece of work with an organisation, um, and um, clearly one of the phrases that I'd used in terms of saying to people, "This is about you know, how you how you think, how you work, and all that kind of stuff," was um, was it's a way of life, not a diet. And um, so this was about getting people into a, a regular habit of doing something as opposed to kind of, you know, doing a quick fad in terms of, you know, sort of uh, you know, the, 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 that, that approach to it. And and when I left, I, I got a silver hip flask on it was engraved. It's a way of life, not a diet. So, um, so which I thought was lovely. Yeah. And, and there you go. And there's a good, a great example of somebody that, that it wasn't about a hip flask with your name on it. It was about a hip flask with something that meant something to you on it. 
Yes. Uh, and largely, I don't think, I mean, I might be wrong, but I don't think our names particularly mean anything to us, yeah. um, you know, as individuals. So when somebody, you know, and I've got one sitting on my desk here, uh, you know, from the Share a Coke campaign all those years ago, eight years ago, um, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, with with my wife's name on the label, and and you know that that for me is a memory of that campaign, not necessarily a memory of her, uh, which which is which is a little bit strange. And you mentioned the word fad in there, which I, I think or, or or sort of um, craze, let's call it for our for our American friends. Um, I don't think this is a craze. I think being able to deploy personalized thinking and and thoughtfulness. Has been around for for centuries, um, really. Uh, in, in you know, back to the days of embroidered initials on handkerchiefs, or, or um, Henry VIII apparently used to embroider the initials of his current wife into her curtains yeah. in her in her bedroom um, yeah. until she realised they were being unpicked, and and you know the day was not going to go well. Um, so you know, we're we're not. This isn't a craze as such, but it's what what's changed, I guess. And to bring this sort of back to print is the technology that has advanced over the last 10, 15, 20 years for the print industry to utilize little bits of information rather than lots of bits of information. You mentioned to me earlier on about having worked with exam boards for schools and colleges, I guess, um, and the amount of printed documents that must have been created, um, you know, but, but I guess not one of them actually arrived with the pupil's name on it. No, what's what's really interesting about that is that you could start to do that nowadays because you could put barcodes on so mm. that you know, if you've got you know something that says Mike Wistow has entered the exam for I don't know let's call it English or something like that, then you could actually have a paper which comes out to me that says Mike Wistow. So in terms of all that kind of fail safe stuff, if that comes and you, you know you're you're sitting at your desk and um, you get a paper that says Mike Wistow on it, you know that it's the wrong paper. Mm-hmm. So a whole host of kind of um, you know automatic fail safes are built in by doing that. If you get those and they arrive, um, and again there are different ways you can do this. If they arrive at your organisation and you know you you look at the list of people who are entered, you look at the list of papers that have come. Again, you've got a cross check and you've got a fail safe. What I find interesting um, and would be would be interested in picking your brains on is that whole kind of technology change um, means that you could do that in a variety of ways so you could you could have that so it's delivered electronically and therefore if i have the passcode i could i could open that up and i could do it on my ipad or this computer or whatever it could arrive electronically at the exam center you could print it all out and you could still sit me in front of a desk with somebody walking around kind of you know and making sure i'm silent and not talking to anybody else um and and there's a whole host of that stuff which you know is 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 personalization if you like in a very practical way Hmm. in terms of how how you could do that for in that instance an exam board and as i worked with the kind of the the the, the printers who were doing that kind of thing you start to say well well how are you doing this and you know they're getting the electronic files in so it's very easy for them to take the electronic files and turn those into barcodes and put those on so you could you you could not only trace everything but you can put the names on everything and so on I think that's really interesting in terms of, you know, where the next stages might go. Well, this is where, of course, when I say technology, um, it's not just equipment. Uh, um, you know, digital printers has been a, mm. a huge um, sort of change point to an awful lot of printers around the world in their ability to do a million ones rather yeah. than the other. Um, but it, it, it's the adaptation from a software perspective that has allowed variable data to flow. Uh, to printers so they can do those million ones you know it's still the same excel spreadsheet in, in essence yeah. or csv yeah. file um, but in, within it contains a million different names and a million different addresses yeah. the same product is all being sent to um, yeah. and that's what's changed the the dial in in terms of of um, technology and and some have adopted that and adopted it more than others um, and used it to their advantage I, I can think of various greetings card companies um, you know around the world that i'm sure you and i have both used where you know the, the days when you used to have to go to the shop and, and choose a greetings card that seemed the most appropriate and then sent it to the person you wished to send it to. Now you can go online and create your own greetings card. So it is entirely appropriate or in some cases entirely inappropriate um, uh, and send that uh, you know to, to the, the recipient. All of those files, of course, go straight to a printer who doesn't really care which which is which that they've just got a million cards to print and dis- and distribute and that's where you know to your point about exam papers the only the only issue i have with exam papers i guess and this is me being devil's advocate 
is security of knowledge because if you can scan it on your smartphone to make sure you've got your right exam paper you can also google the answers um you know so this is why they don't let you take smartphones into exams i guess um so that it, there's some nuance in there but i like the fact that that and and you're picking up on the point that i really wanted to talk about today is that personalization is not rooted solely in gifting uh, it's it's you know that's that's one of them it's the one that we've all seen the most and it was really where it came out in the same way that the internet is not entirely for porn it's just that's the way that everybody largely saw it first or gaming or or whatever you know the the, the power that these things have is so much greater than the than the examples that we've seen so far and my worry mike is that that personalization as a as a as a as a topic is being linked solely to the the few things that you've seen and therefore, think that all things are those things. Um, I used the Coca-Cola example earlier on, and, and we, we don't seem in the last eight years to have moved beyond putting names on labels and labels on things. And yet what we're talking about this morning is education, um, uh, you know, timetables, um, information, you know, all of which can be personalized to the individual. The internet does a very good job of that, of, of, of creating your own diary, your own, your own life. Where, where would you, on that notion, where would you see personalization being an advantage for you in your working life? If, if I could, that as a slight kind of side angle, if you like. Yeah. So um, I've been, you um, don't know how much you've done with the automotive industry, but the, yeah, they, but... They, have, they have the concept of runners, repeaters and strangers. And I've been surprised how few people have come across this. So I, so I use it quite a lot, yeah. Um, and and essentially to, to to kind of you know cut a cut a half day session into something which is kind of you know a, a one liner, it's effectively the bit that sort of says you know people people get blocked in terms of thinking what do we do if we have to set up our systems for the occasion when you know a a red haired blue eyed man with one leg and uh, and one arm and with five hands on it, with 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 six fingers on it and stuff like that comes in. And so they 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 set their systems up, whether those are kind of service systems, manufacturing systems, or whatever, for that. Um, and then you know, the whole organisation gets bogged down. If you've got the concept of runners, repeaters, and strangers, you say to people, roughly eighty percent of what you do is going to be a bog standard thing. So that's the runners. It's it's the thing you you you, you gear up to. Um, in the automotive industry, that's your kind of you know your your your, your four door and hatch, and so you yeah. your, your five yeah. door car. Um, roughly 15 to 18 percent is going to be something which is you know equally kind of recognizable but you know it's it's not your bog standard stuff so that's in the automotive industry let's let's say that's the you know the kind of um the estate so you know you're going to get those you put them down a different way and away you go and then that remaining one percent two percent are not one percent or two percent which are exactly the same each of those is individualized so that if you say i want a car which has got a gold steering wheel a bose stereo and i don't know platinum alloys or whatever the next person might come along and say i want a silver steering wheel i want a bang and some stereo and i want um pink cakes alloys or whatever it might be and and there's something about in the same way i used that yeah, example earlier about gp practices there are things that i want to be personalized for there are things that i want to be recognized as an individual for well, the same applies in in the rest of our kind of day to day lives, which is there is there is stuff that I'm actually quite happy. You know, if I go to the shop and I, I buy a you know a, a loaf of bread, I'm quite happy to get that. That's that's what the baker does as the kind of you know the 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 runners actually. I might decide I want a fancy one with I don't know walnuts in or something, and they'll know I'm going to do that. And then maybe at Christmas I'll have some you know a, a loaf of bread or a baguette that's got Mike written across it, and 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 all those kind of bits and pieces. And it's and it's that kind of thing. And and for me, it's about you know that that whole kind of concept about runners, repeaters, and strangers allows people to think about how they do the personalization agenda and how they do that in such a way that it's actually effective for them as an organisation. And where you talked about technology earlier, um, you know, in terms of printing. It's a damn sight easier nowadays to to do that kind of thing because you can change it on the software as opposed to having you know to to, to reset the whole kind of print and, and and all that stuff that you know goes goes back to my very early uh, early use and, and and so on. So so there's something about actually tying that in with with where it makes kind of you know commercial sense to do it, as well as where it's a jolly good thing to do because actually that that's what I want. You're listening to the Up Close and Personal podcast with me, Richard Askham, and my guest today, Mike Wisto. And we're just talking about really, I guess, Mike, the, the 
not necessarily the amount of people that, that would embrace personalization, but the times in their life when it would have the most benefit. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, and maybe that's why it's got stuck a little bit in gifting, because it's it's allowed people to demonstrate thought where previously they just bought the same bar of chocolate for everybody and everybody got the same gift. And so therefore, it, you know, it was not thoughtless, but but not not, you know, mm-hmm. not with the requisite amount of thought, should we say. Um, but I, I'm just going to take take that point that you've just made, actually, um, is that there are times when it's relevant and times when it's not. So for the for the print industry and and also brands and retailers and agencies and um, yeah, all of the people in the value chain with regard to how can we add a little bit of surprise and delight to consumers, the fairy dust, if you like, when it's needed. Personalization 2.0 for me is where you recognize that that can work and add value and you then deploy it. It's not just in gifting. If that 5%, as you just described it, when when you want to, you will. And and 5% of the Earth's population is, you know, quite a lot of people. Um, You know, there's a huge opportunity out there. For you as an individual, when would you choose to use personalization And more importantly, when would you choose not to? Good question, Richard. Um, It's my job. I guess. (laughs) I get. I guess there's kind of two aspects of that. One is one is the one where, as you you know, as we've talked about, I I want a gift. I want something to make me feel important. Mm -hmm. The other is, I think. um, I've just caught sight of myself on the screen. So the other is, I did some work with a with a, a, a an organisation that makes glasses, as in these kind of glasses. Yep. And the other is, I actually want these to be personalised because mm. if not, then I actually can't read and I can't see what's going on, on the screen. Okay. So there's some very practical stuff, which is those need to be personalised. There's some stuff where I want a gift. Um, there's some stuff which is kind of halfway between the two, isn't there? Because, you know, this is kind of, you know, I could have this with Mike written across it, or I could have it, you know, standard as it is. But actually, I kind of, I want it with this kind of size and shape, and I want it to keep me warm. Yep. Um, and so I think there's a mix, isn't there? Um, and this is where, and, and you know, what's really interesting for me with the conversations that I'm having is that everybody has a slightly different view of what personalised means. And, mm. and I keep saying, and I will keep saying, that it shouldn't just be about gifting. Uh, yeah. yeah, you mentioned medicine earlier on, and I was listening to a report on the radio yesterday about how you know, med- the, the advancements in medical technology has allowed now medication to be personalised to the individual patient. So again, using the P word, but but individualised would but would probably be a better better word for you. So it doesn't get lost in translation. And I think this is largely if there is a problem, and I might be overplaying this, but if there is a problem with adoption of utilizing personalization it's because it's got stuck with one reference point that yeah. personalization means a bar of toberone with your name on it or a, or a jumper with mike across the front which i wouldn't have by the way just just as your personal stylist um no. uh, you know so I, I don't know mike whether we need to almost either expand people's understanding of what personalized means or allow all the different phrases you you've talked about the car industry i would call that configuration um, you've talked about clothing. I would call that bespoke tailoring. Um, you know, all of these things lead to the same place, which is an individual's choice of what they wish to have in a world where manufacturers and retailers and 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 so on and so forth are able to deliver that. Um, it, do you think that's uh, you know, I'm, 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 am I barking up the wrong tree in terms of, of trying to trying to make that debate work? Uh, not at all. I've got a question for you in terms of if you, if you look at this from the producer side, then. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I think is interesting is is if you look at this from the producer side, you also need to make this kind of successful. And from my kind of work with various organisations, if if you've got someone who is trying to you know look at that um, overly specialist stuff and forget what I've described as runners, repeaters, and strangers. Mm-hmm then they can put an awful lot of cost into the business that they don't need to put into it. So, uh, again, I've worked with a, um, let's be vague, a, a large organisation which had some stuff that you know, worked very simply and some stuff that you, know, you needed to kind of get a, an expert advice on. And what they were doing was they were they were getting stuff so that it was ready for the expert advisor. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And actually, as we looked at it and we talked them through it, we said, well, you know, this this is your standard stuff. This is what you know someone who's been in the job for three months can do, where you know, without, without support and advice. If they get a kind of something which is more complex, don't you pass that through to to another person? And it's interesting in terms of that was that was very much a um, a, a a a knowledge based industry. Let's call it. Mm-hmm. But the principle behind that knowledge based industry is the same as the principle behind the automotive industry, which is that there's a point where you want to get into that level of complexity. You want to get into that level of configuration. You want to get into that level of personalization. You, you know, we've we've used all of those kind of different pieces. And I think there's something about doing that in in such a way that you you, know, you you map out what you're doing and then you say, where do we actually need to get into the personalization stuff and where that's cost effective for us to do so? Because otherwise, you know, it must be, you know, I, I haven't gone into this in any detail, so um, it must be very, very difficult to get that personalized approach and make it cost effective. And mm-hmm. so it's it's that kind of balance, isn't it? But, you know, you're. Your thoughts on that? I'd be really interested in. Yeah, no, well, and it is, you know, the the, the wider debate, Mike, um, really about where where the value of personalization sits, and and also, you know, it's the old debate, isn't it, about the difference between cost and value? And and I know from experience, um, you know, there's a lot of certainly in the print industry, a lot of people haven't gone down the route of individualized products because they 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 see cost, but they don't see value. And the irony of that, and I described it as an elegant death, because you you are largely agreeing to to, to not deal with people who who want to give you more money. The the point of personalization is it does add value. It also yeah. adds um, benefits. You know, I I come from the wine industry, um, and the reason I got into personalization was to to you know my my um, product got very heavily commoditized uh, by the supermarkets in the UK, and I needed a standout reason for people to want to buy their wine from me. So by creating personalized labels for those wines, um, you know, I was I was creating value back and then gaining the customer. I didn't see it as adding cost and complexity. I saw it as gaining customers because it, it was it was a different offering. Um, and and also adding margin, uh, you know, back to the product rather simply. So the, there's a, you know, there's the debate continues to rage really between is it worth us doing this? My argument is, can you afford not to? Um, you know, it's 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 the risk of inaction, isn't it, on on ROI um, as yeah. far as the world is concerned? Because we as consumers, our expectation levels have grown, you know, really out of all proportions. I can still remember. I'm old enough to remember. I think you might be too. Uh, the days when we used to order and it was 28 days delivery, um, yeah. and if, and if it came in 25 days, you were delighted. Um, yeah. And now, after 25 minutes you're emailing you know amazon saying where is my order you know so we we've in a very short space of time we've allowed technology and its associated elements like personalization to almost drive our behavior rather than the other way around and and that for me is where this show this personalization experience show is going to be so interesting to get as many people as we can inside the tent to understand what it could mean for them not what they already know it means. And and I, I don't like the words education when it comes to business because it sounds terribly patronizing. But I think this is this is a, a, a massive awareness campaign for everybody that's associated with giving stuff, whatever that stuff is, that they could do it slightly differently. And it's possible to do without, you know, off the charts costs that that makes it um you know non cost effective. Uh, it, it, you know in, in your world, Mike, if you could, yeah, you know, this Christmas we're talking just before Christmas. I know this will play out in in the new year, but but just before Christmas, you know, have you got any plans to do any personalised gifting at all? Yes, um, and okay. that's really you can tell me because the, the recipient won't know before Christmas, so we're not spoiling anybody's surprise. No, not at all, not at all. Um, yeah, and that's also interesting because, um, you know, at, at the moment there is how would I put it in the UK some uncertainty as to whether cards will be delivered um and, and timing so so actually you know it's it's much easier nowadays that you know you could do you know whether it's the picture there or another picture you know you can do that as personalized electronic kind of um gifting isn't it you could you, you know you could do that and say you know merry christmas mike or whatever it, it, it is and it may be that actually that's that's what happens this christmas because you know it's the the physical cards aren't going to get there well, and therein lies the risk, of course, for a debate for another day, which we won't get into yeah. the politics of it all. But, 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 you know, when when an industry 
and I've said this before from stage, so I, so I say this with all due respect to anybody listening from the print industry, when an industry sees itself as the way it's always done things, yes. then then largely its its consumers will leave it behind. It you know it will be stood there going, where has everybody gone? And you know, for example, the post office, the the Royal Mail, the delivery of cards. If they don't do it for whatever reason, we'll find another way of doing it. Uh, you know, yeah. we, we are, as Darwin once said, very good at adaptation. That's why we're still here. And technology, and and you know, look at COVID as an example. At, at the period of, of our lives when we were told you can't do this, and the majority, not everybody, but the majority went, okay, I'll do this then. And and they adopted new practices instantly because they could. So you know, the, there's a risk here, isn't that if that if old legacy services stop delivering because they want to hang on to the legacy, but their audience has left the theatre, it's going to be a very lonely show, isn't it? And 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 interestingly, again, in terms of you know, so so my background, I you know, many years ago I ran IT systems, and when I say many years ago, you know, that's that's kind of Microsoft DOS. And in the days when I said Windows will never take off because people can't afford the hardware and the memory, you know, and, and so on. Yeah, not not one of my greater pro prophecies. Um, but but I was taking people off typewriters and putting them onto the word processors. I had a chief exec who insisted that his his, 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 his PA had everything printed off so he could read it um, when emails came in. And I think what's also happening is the rest of the world is moving on. So, you know, the um, you know, the, the, the the youngsters nowadays from the age of what, less than 15 have grown up with kind of, you know, smartphones and iPads and, and yeah, tablets, excuse me. <coughs> and um, so the world is moving on, irrespective of whatever the industry is. And so there's a whole skill base and a whole expectation that people are are, are wanting that is, is kind of nothing to do with all of just during is because the world around has moved on mm -hmm. and so you know those those old chief execs who said you know i'm not going to use a computer because that's what the te secretaries do and you know i had that kind of thing mm -hmm. um yeah they, they they soon went out the door you know it was um and the same i think happens around here is the expectations that people come to because they will get it from the gaming industry or they will get it from amazon or whatever they get it from they turn around and they say, why can't I have that from a printer? Why can't I have that from a doctor? Why can't I have that, et cetera, et cetera? And, and the expectations are changing, I think. And and I think, just to wrap this up, Mike, um, that's being led by the consumers now. Uh, and no longer are we, you know, we're the shepherds rather than the sheep, um, yeah. I, I think, in that regard. And that's probably the single biggest change um, around personalization 2.0 is what do we want and who do we have to go to to get it? Um, uh, you know, I think, and that's the biggest change in probably our lives, isn't it? Yeah, very yeah. much so. Mike Wistow, you've been a fabulous guest today. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and, and conversation. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Um, you've also got the perfect voice for radio. So uh, so anybody listening to this, um, you know, in fact, you'd probably be better off listening to us because we, we look like a couple of old farts, really, talking about the good old days, but which is, in fact is actually true. I might even call this episode. <laughs> As you say, I think I'm older than you, Richard. Yes, yeah, same old farts, rambling on about nonsense, yep. but... Mike, listen, it's been lovely to talk to you. Have a lovely Christmas. Um, and, and please do uh, come and find us at the Personalization Experience next year in Munich if you if you get chance. It would be great to have your opinions there um, as well. And, and for anybody listening or watching this today, thank you for watching Up Close and Personal. Um, we'll wish you a Merry Christmas, even though this might be played out in March. Who knows? But, but right today, it's a happy Christmas from myself and Mike. And we'll see you somewhere soon. Thank you, Richard.